Welcome, uh, I'm Phil Lockwood. I operate uh, Lockwood Aviation Supply and the Lockwood Aviation Group. Here you're going to see a, a two-hour presentation by our Head of Technical Oversight and our instructor for our engine schools, Dean Vogel. And he's going to give you some great information about the Rotax engines, basic service and operational information. Also, you get an idea what it might be like going to one of his two-day schools, the service and the two-day maintenance school, which I'd encourage you to do. I hope you enjoy it. Okay, there's a facility in Gunskelken. The village is that direction over there. They just basically built a farm on the side of a farming village. And uh, now, you, as you can see, it, almost the whole farm is covered with buildings or asphalt. A uh, very large facility. They produce about 1,200 engines a day. But they only produce about 5,000 aircraft engines a year. So aircraft engines are only about 2% of their business. Okay. RFSC is the, uh, the training body uh, that uh, Rotax is authorized. So basically, if you're going to be doing any serious <coughs> maintenance on your engines, you really do want to get tra training. There are a couple of individuals who have in here that have been through the training. So uh, they can tell you what the value of, of doing that is. Some important websites for those of you who are going to be doing anything with it. FlyRotax.com is the factory website. Right? You can go there and download any of the current documentation on the engines, and you should be doing that. Uh, RotaxOwner.com is the website done by Rotec Research. They're up in Vernon, British Columbia. They've got a lot of uh, very good videos on different details of maintaining the engine. Uh, if you register your name there, they will send you a notification anytime Rotax comes out with a new document or a new revision of an old one. And then of course Lockwood.arrow for all your parts and, and tool needs, okay, on your Rotax engine. All right, uh, unique features of the engine as opposed to other aircraft engines. The crankshaft is not a one-piece crankshaft like on like, like Homington Continentals and Franklins and all that. Uh, there's actually multiple pieces, five pieces to the crankshaft itself and they're press fit, all right. So there's a number of advantages to that um, that I won't detail or take the time to detail at the moment. But one of the big ones is the crankshaft will not crack. Were you to get a propeller strike, and uh, if you do that on Lycoming or Continental, you've got to tear down the engine because the crankshaft has to get eddy current or magna flux inspection of some sort. Uh, this will not crack. It will twist those press fit joints before anything will crack. And you can measure that from outside the engine. So if you come through the, the maintenance training, I teach you how to do that. So you can tell without ever taking your engine apart if the crankshaft is good. Uh, dry sump <coughs> oil system, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Uh, but one of the big advantages to that is that you can carry a lot less oil in the system. So it's a lot lighter. You, your other similar engines are carrying five or six or nine quarts of oil with you all the time. This one carries three. Uh, another advantage to this is that all the oil is in a tank. The crank case is not vented. Uh, the crank case pressure is what's used to push the oil back to the tank. So the only vent in the system is on the tank itself. And both connections between the tank and the have oil traps in them. So that means atmospheric air can't get to the inside of the engine. So as a result, Corrosion on the inside of these engines is just basically unheard of. Uh, and as long as you didn't do it in salt water, you can recover the engine. So you'd want to make a quick phone call. Yeah, if there should be more chairs. Here. Okay, cooling system. The heads are liquid cooled. Uh, now, one important thing about that is that. Uh, this is not like a P-51. If you lose all your coolant, you're not going to be on fire in 10 minutes. Um, so, if you were to blow all your coolant overboard and you're not in a safe position to land, you keep flying. All right. Now, you'd want to reduce the power to, to just enough to maintain a level flight. Uh, and even at that, you may, depending upon how long you fly it that way, you may damage the heads. And will it be expensive to repair them? Yes, but it'll be a lot less expensive than paying for a new airplane or paying for a hospital bill. Now, most of you guys are here because of air cams, so you got two of them. So yes, were you to blow all your coolant overboard on one of them, 
uh, you might want to consider pushing up the power on the good one and shutting down the, the one that you lost the coolant on. Okay, gearbox. Uh, we put a gearbox on there because we can get the horsepower that we want from a smaller, lighter engine if we run it at a higher RPM. The other advantage that gives us is propellers would rather be at a lower RPM. Propellers like to operate down around 2,000 to 2,100 RPM. So a direct drive engine that's running them at 25, 27, 2,900 RPM, that's a compromise. The engine would rather not be there and the propeller would rather not be there. So since Rotax is as good as they are at doing gearboxes, we got that in the mix. Capacitive discharge ignition, this is what it looks like on the carbureted engines. It's a dual solid state system, um, completely independent of each other, parallel, identical systems, very, very robust. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as long as we get time to get there. Just talking here about fuel consumption uh, as compared to other aircraft engines of power to weight ratio. They're basically no competition for them. Uh, this is just a little bit of history on um, Rotax with aircraft engines. It runs through the two strokes that they had in the 80s and when they came out with the four stroke engines. And then they came out with the uh, ASTM compliance in uh, 2005 and 2006. And then the TBO increases in 2009 and 2010. So the newer engines, everything with a new case in there. Engines produced after July of 2006, they have a 2,000 hour TBO on the engine. All right? There are certified versions of the engine. The way you tell the difference is the color of the data tag. Most of the engines you see will be a black data tag. That's the non-certified version, the ASTM compliant version. And then the red data tags are FAR 33 or JAR 22 certified versions of the engine. Is there any difference technically? No. But when an engine's going down the assembly line at the factory, they say, okay, this one's going to get a certified serial number. So they do 100% parts traceability on that engine. They take more measurements, do more tests. It spends more time in the test cell at the end. So once the two engines go into the crates, the only difference between the two of them is a wad of paper about that deep and about a $7,000 delta in price. But other than that, technically, there's no difference. Now, maintenance-wise, if you're ordering parts for a certified engine, you need to make sure that the parts ladies know, I'm ordering for a certified engine, because they have to get the parts from a different parts chain for that engine. And also, if you've got an SLSA airplane that has a certified engine, then it needs to be an a and that is doing the maintenance on that engine. Let him slide into my office and grab the chair out of the corner there. Oh, that's okay. I can stay. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, I already talked about the engine types, the 912 black valve covers. That'll be the 80-horse engine. The turbocharged version of the 80-horse engine has the red valve covers. That's 115 horse. And then the green valve covers, like you see here, that's the ULS. And the 912 IS Sport, that's the green valve covers, like you see there. Okay, now, quick safety item for you. One word on prop starting this engine, don't. All right, let me show you what happens here. Okay, I'm gonna back it up for just a second and describe what's going on there. This engine does not start like a Lycoming or Continental. It does not have impulse couplings on a Magneto. So it's not a nice, lazy, you know, pull it and step back kind of thing. It won't work. In order to get the ignition to fire on this engine, you have to be spinning it in excess of 240 RPM, which means you've got to put everything you've got into it to get it going that fast. And once you've done that, where are you? Right next to the propeller disc. Okay? And then it doesn't start like a light comb or Continental. It doesn't catch on one cylinder and now on two and now on four. Typically, you turn a half a revolution and it catches a half a revolution later, it's at 2,000 RPM. Okay? So here you are now, like this with your ear right next to an 800 RPM propeller. All right? You don't want to be doing that. It's a 12 volt system. It's way too easy to pull up with a car or a boat or even a motorcycle and jump start it. So don't try prop starting this thing. Okay. All right. Oil system. 
key items to look at on there, the oil tank, the oil cooler, and then the oil pump and filter. Okay, here's the way the system works. You're sucking oil from a stand tube in the tank. It goes through the oil cooler to the oil pump. The oil pump is a positive displacement pump. Uh, it pushes the oil out to the outside of the filter, goes through the filter element, comes out the middle. This is where my temperature sensor are, is and my oil pressure regulator. The oil pressure regulator bleeds oil back to the inlet on the pump. The pump, like I said, is positive displacement. It's going to move a volume of oil in ratio to the engine speed. It couldn't care less what the pressure is. So you need an oil pressure regulator to drop the oil pressure down to what's appropriate for the engine. So that's why that's in there. And the oil goes down galleries in the engine, feeds the hydraulic lifters and any, all the bearing points, including the rod bearings on the crankshaft. It comes back up the one three side of the engine, and that's where my pressure sensor is. So hydraulically, whatever the pressure sensor sees, that's what all my other components on the oil gallery are seeing as well. The front end of the crankshaft is hollow, and it resides in a bronze bushing up in the front right here. So oil comes past that bronze bushing into the bottom of the gearbox. In the web between the gearbox cavity and the crankcase cavity, there's a hole about this high, so the oil has to fill that cavity up to that point before it starts pouring back into the crankcase. The drive gear on the crankshaft is in that pool of oil, so it picks the oil up and it squeezes out between the teeth on the drive gear and the dog gear, so it makes a mist. So when the engine is at operating RPM, there's a mist of oil inside there so thick that you wouldn't see your hand this far in front of your face. That's how all the components get lubricated in the gearbox. Dane, where's the uh, temperature sensor? Temperature sensor is right there, right where the oil comes out of the oil filter. Okay. All right. Once the oil is done doing its thing in the engine, it sags down to the bottom of the crankcase down here, and it covers the return port. So then the blow-by pressure that I have in the crankcase from the engine running pushes that oil back over to the oil tank again. All right. Got more? Okay. All right. Here is the return ports on the bottom of the engine. Uh, this is the PTO end of the engine. This is the oil filter. So, being on air cams, you guys are all going to be hooked up to this port. All right. If it was in a tractor configuration, it would be hooked up to this port instead. The idea is the lower corner of the engine is where you want the oil to pool. All right. So, in a high power climb. All the oil is going to pool over here in this corner, so it's going to cover that port, so that as soon as you have crankcase pressure, it pushes that oil back to the oil tank. All right, the proper installation will have the oil tank positioned so that the full level of oil is somewhere between the prop shaft and the inlet on the oil pump. On an air cam, it's about right when you're sitting there because your oil tank is up here like this, so when you're sitting on the tail gear like that, you're just slightly below what the prop shaft is with the full level of the oil in the tank. Uh, the reason that's important is when you're doing pre-flights, if the engine sits for a long period of time, and for instance, if you have a tank that's mounted really high, the oil will have a tendency to siphon down into the engine. All right. So uh, when you're going to check your oil level, you're going to see that your oil level is low. So then what you're going to want to do is burp the tank in order to get the oil pushed back into the tank and then check your dipstick again. So if you're doing pre-flight, you pull the dipstick. If you're in the normal range, go fly and be happy. All right? If it's below the normal range, don't just go adding oil. Burp the tank first, recheck the oil level, and then add as necessary. Uh, you, you probably aren't low on oil, it's just that some of the oil is sitting in the engine right now and you need to push it back in the tank to get an accurate reading. All right? By the way, when you go to do the burping of the tank, you pull the cover off the tank so you can hear it. I mean, you can do it without pulling the cap, but you can't hear it very well. And then you turn the engine over. Now, when you do that, probably the easier technique is you pull the blade until you feel a compression stroke, pull it into the compression stroke, and hold it for about one second, you know, like 1,001. And then you push it again. You've, you'll find that you've paused just long enough to let the air get past the piston. So when you go to move it again, that compression stroke is gone. So you go to the next one, and you do it again. And then you go to the next one, and do it again. 
One of the big advantages of that is it's a lot less sweaty than just trying to motor the engine over. All right? So you're just pulling it in the compression stroke, giving it a moment for the air to get past the piston. Okay, here's some limits on there. Maximum pressure on the oil is 100 PSI. Minimum is 12. You don't want to see it down there. Um, you don't want to see it below 29. So if you're seeing your system drop down below 29, do something about it immediately. All right? Give us a shout. We'll figure out what's going on. Oil temperatures, 266 degrees maximum. Uh, minimum 120 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to talk more about that when we get to the oil filters. Normal is about 190 to 230. You want to see a minimum of 190 on your oil temperature because if you're below that, you're not going to be boiling the water off out of the oil and you're going to cause problems inside of the engine as a result. If you start seeing up over 230, then you're, you got other issues there too. So 190 to 230 is about where you want to see it. Oil change, here's a service instruction that you want to have stowed away in your computer, SI912016. That's for all the operating fluids, but we're talking about oils here at this point. Operating with unleaded and low lead fuel, that's less than 0.1 grams per liter of lead content. So 100 low lead does not mean, you know, does not meet this criteria right here. So forget about that. All right. If you're operating primarily on unleaded fuel or um, mo gas, basically you do your oil changes according to the maintenance manual. All right. That's 100 hours between oil and filter changes. Uh, unless you're in severe operating conditions, if you're up in the UP or northern Minnesota and you're in you know, single digits or below zero, uh, that would be a severe operating condition. Or if you're in Baja and it's really dusty and hot, that would be a severe operating condition. Or if you're out towing gliders with your air cam or something like that where you're full power to 3,000 feet and idle to the ground all day long, that would be a severe operating condition. So then you would want to be reducing the interval on your oil changes. There's only one approved oil. Um, service Instruction 16 only has approved oils listed now, whereas previous revisions had recommended oils. I think I've got that. No, not yet. Um, they used to list recommended oils. What those were were oils that were available in different parts of the world that distributors in those areas had gotten good experience with. So for instance, Mobile One Racing 4T is an oil that we've got really good experience with. All right? It's a fully synthetic oil. Uh, not, this is not Mobile One automotive oil. This is Racing 4T. It's a motorcycle oil. In general, you want to stick with motorcycle oils on your engine because they're formulated for engines that have an integral gearbox and wet clutch. All right, guess what you've got on your engine? All right, uh, they've also got Mobile One V Twin. Uh, it's a higher viscosity oil, very similar. They're both fully synthetic oils, uh, and most of the temperature ranges you'll ever see, this is going to work just fine, uh, unless you were in really hot temperatures you wouldn't be worried about using the 20W50 oil. And then of course Aeroshell Sport Plus 4 uh, is an oil that's a semi-synthetic uh, and that was developed in conjunction between Rotax and Shell specifically for these engines. <coughs> Alright, operation with leaded avgas. If you're operating with leaded avgas, we recommend to change engine oil every 25 operating hours. Right? If you're over 30% of the time on 100 low lead, you need to drop it down to 50 hours. If you're over 50% of the time on 100 low lead, you really should be dropping it to 25 hours. And you should be emptying or you know, opening the tank and cleaning the lead out of the tank every time you change the oil. All right? Otherwise, you're going to get a lot of lead built up in there and you'll be giving your engine the equivalent of arterial sclerosis. So you need to pay attention to that if you're doing a lot of 100 low lead. Okay, here's some of the recommended oils like what I was talking about. Okay, oil change. If you look in the maintenance manual they've, where they've got instructions for doing the oil change, on one page they say, no, run engine to warm oil before beginning oil change procedure. 
And then on another page they say, warning, risk of severe burns and scalds, hot engine parts, always allow engine to cool down to ambient temperature before starting any work. It's kind of like, okay, which way do you want it, guys? All right. So basically what I do is I say, look, why do we start, why do we run a light combing or continental before we do an oil or filter change? I'm sorry? So the oil will run out of you. Okay, reduce the viscosity of the oil, and what's another reason? The sludge is free. There you go. So you stir up all the junk. Okay. Well, on this particular system, I didn't talk extensively about the tank, but the tank is built so that any junk that is developed settles into the bottom of the oil tank. All right? Underneath the separator plate. So is any amount of running the engine going to change that? No. All right? So if it's not going to help, why work with a hot engine? All right? So don't bother. All right? Uh, use only brand name oil in accordance with service instruction 16, which is what we were just talking about. The engine must not be cranked when the oil system is open. So if you've got the oil tank drained or disconnected, or you've got the oil filter off, you do not want to be turning the propeller on the engine, because you'll be pulling air into parts of the engine where you don't want it. Uh, compressed air should not be blown through the oil system. Okay, the ARC process tells us that if we drain, if we burp the tank, so we push the oil out of the engine into the tank, and then we drain the tank, and maybe clean the tank, and then put new oil in it, okay, that works. All right. Do you still have some oil in the oil lines and in the oil cooler and in the bottom of the gearbox? Yes. A cup and a half, maybe two cups. Okay, it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't hurt the system at all. Now, somebody might ask, but what if I'm changing oil brands? You're right. Okay, you got to be concerned about that because sometimes the additives between oils do not play well together. So what you do is you do your normal oil change using the new brand oil that you're going to use, run the engine two to five hours, something like that, and do another oil change. All right, and then for all intents and purposes, the old oil is gone, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, uh, crank engine by hand to transfer oil from the crankcase, that's burping the tank like we were just talking about. Uh, oil drain screw if you're going to drain it from the tank. Some people uh, with air cams like to use the quick drains. Rotax doesn't like those, okay, but um, the air cam can be challenging. I've seen some people come up with some really neat tools for reaching up underneath the tank and draining the oil over the top of the wing and down into a bucket. So. Um, the pumps work well. Okay. They I, can, I pump all my oil out. Yeah, there's, there's another technique. You pump it from the top? Pump it from the top, okay. yeah. I pump it out from the top, yeah. yeah. And, and, and again, if you're doing 100 low lead, you're going to be pulling the cover off of the tank anyway to be able to clean everything out. So what technique, you know, then you don't even have to bother pulling the plug and dealing with the safety wire. But if, I want to, if I'm running 93, 99% of the time, I can just pump it from the top of the tank and then change the filter. Right. The 270 degrees hand tight. Right. You said there's a plate in there, though. He's not getting the oil below the plate. Not unless you pull the, the cover and the uh, screen so and the plate out. So my pumping Correct. it isn't doing it. He's, he's still got the right. If you're if you if you've got a small tube and you're yeah. pumping it from down, yeah, you're not getting all the oil out okay. because there is there is going to be probably a half a port yeah. down in the in the bottom of the tank. It won't come out. Okay, install new oil filter. I'll talk about that here in a moment. Carrying out the oil change, the engine should be cranked by hand in the direction of rotation, approximately 20 turns to completely refill the entire oil circuit. That's if you use the drain plug in the bottom of the tank. Okay, put the plug back in there, safety wire it, three quarts of oil, 20 revolutions on the propeller to get the oil fed back through the engine again. All right. Okay, install, remove of all oil filter. All right, uh, I'm gonna, I got it here just to, for emphasis. After you've done an oil and filter change, you're going to take the engine out, run it up, warm it up, do a leak check, shut it down, let it cool off to room temperature, and then come back and check the oil filter. All right, if the oil filter was installed properly, once the engine has been warmed up and then cooled off once to room temperature, you will not move that thing by hand. Not going to happen. Matter of fact, when you go to pull it, this is my new favorite tool for removing oil filters. Tisha's got these in stock now. Okay, 
and that thing grabs right onto the, it's not a hex, but the, the fluted end of the oil filter, and then the other end has exactly the right size end on it for the new uh, magnetic plug on the side of the engine as well. So, great tool. All right. And, and no, you do not want to use that tool to put an oil filter on. We'll talk about that in a moment. Okay, check the oil tank and clean. Okay, uh, every 200 hours they now recommend emptying the tank and cleaning it out. Checking it to make sure you're in good shape. If you're running 100 low lead, you should be doing that every time you change the oil filter. All right, get the lead out of the tank. I can tell you stories about that. Okay, if you're going to be pulling the cover off of the oil tank, make sure that when you go to pull the oil lines off of there, you're using a holdback wrench. Does anybody not know what I mean by a hold rack? Hold back wrench. Be honest. Okay, you all understand that. All right. Make sure you use a hold back wrench. Okay, cleaning the oil tank. Just talking about taking it apart, cleaning all the components up, uh, and putting them back in. Oh, this is for putting the uh, drain plug back in. Uh, make sure you use a new gasket ring if you drain the oil by pulling the plug. Reassemble the oil tank by following the same steps in reverse order. That's helpful, okay? Uh, you probably do want to get some training on doing that if you're going to be pulling the tank apart. Incorrect assembly of the oil tank components can cause engine faults or damage or total failure. Uh, and then it says purge the oil system, okay? Uh, purging the oil system is necessary if you've done maintenance work where the lubrication system was opened and voided. So if you are careful when you go to pull your oil lines off of the oil tank, especially the one on the out port, okay? If when you pull that oil line off of there, you immediately go up with the line and then tie it off somewhere with a zip tie or whatever so you don't lose oil out of that line. Then you won't have to do a pressure purge. You just do a vent. If you come to class, we'll teach you how to do that. Um, but you wouldn't have to do the pressure purge. All right, oil filter. There's what the oil filter looks like in cutaway diagram. Here's what some of the components look like. You can see the filter element there torn away. This is the bypass valve. Here is the spring that holds the bypass valve closed. That is the feature right there, which is the reason why you want to make sure that you are, your oil temperature is above 120 degrees Fahrenheit before you select a high power setting, like for takeoff. Okay. The reason for that is below 120 degrees Fahrenheit, the viscosity of the oil is such that when the oil comes through the filter element, the delta P, the difference in pressure between outside and inside the filter, will be enough to open that bypass valve, which means now you're getting unfiltered oil going through the engine. Now that's better than no oil, but it's still not a good thing. All right. So make sure you see 120 degrees Fahrenheit. By the way, that's also a reason why you want to stick with the Rotax oil filters. Can you find automotive oil filters that have a bypass valve in them? Yes, but their opening pressure is about 25% lower than it is on the Rotax filters. So if you have to wait to 120 degrees Fahrenheit on a Rotax filter, what temperature do you have to wait to on that automotive filter? 160 degrees, 180 degrees, who knows? You don't know. All right? So you really do want to stick with the Rotax filters. Okay? Uh, Rotax filters, check the oil flow by turning the engine. New Rotax filters cannot be pre-filled because they got an, another anti-back drain valve in there. Screw the filter onto the basin and then an additional 270 degrees after contact. When you remove the old oil filter, you want to be sure that you're in the habit of cleaning the contact surface on the oil pump housing. The, it's, it's always good for, to have cleanliness as a habit pattern, but the main reason for being in that habit is once in a while when you pull an oil filter off, the gasket will stay behind. And if you don't notice that and you go spinning on a new filter, now the gasket on the filter will be captured by this rim, but the other one that's stuck there will not be. So you fire up the engine, the oil pressure comes up, and that gasket's going to go, Pugh. all right? And guess where all your oil's going to go? And then guess what's going to happen to your engine? All right? Um, those who have been through class before 
no, the mantra in the class, this engine really hates oil starvation. Okay? It will destroy itself very quickly if you do that. All right. So you clean that surface off, put oil on the gasket. Do not use grease. Did everybody hear me say that? Do, I might say, okay, everybody say it with me. <laughs> do not use grease on the oil filter. <laughs> Only oil. Okay? You're going to spin it on there. When you get even contact, it, you can tell that because you're starting to get a torque rise on there when you feel the oil filter going on there. And then you mark yourself a reference point. You can take a Sharpie and mark the rim of the, of the uh, filter if you like, or you just find you know, a reference on the printing on the side of it or whatever at 12 o'clock. And then you're going to take that and spin it another 270 degrees. So you're going to take that from the 12 o'clock position to the 9 o'clock position. Now, that, you may find that to be difficult, right? Especially since at this point you've probably got oil all over your hands and oil on the oil filter as well. Do not use a tool to tighten the filter on there. But what you can do is grab yourself a piece of fine Scotch-Brite and you'll be amazed at the amount of traction you can get on there now, even though you've got oil all over your hands. All right? Now, it's also typical with the newest filters that you only get about 225 degrees instead of 270. If you get it to 225 degrees, you're, you're going to be just fine. About the 730 position, that'll work. The whole idea behind this is I've got oil on there. That helps me get it spun on there to the proper position. I take the engine out. I run it up, I get the oil temperature hot. Once the engine warms up, the viscosity of that oil on the gasket drops and it moves out from between the gasket and the, the metal face on the pump housing. And then that rubber has really good traction on that face. So once you've done that, you let it cool off to room temperature, you come back and you grab that filter again to see if you can move it by hand. It is not going to move if you put it on there correctly. If you can move it, something didn't go right. Back it off, oil it up, do it again. All right? But once you get the experience of trying to take those oil filters off after they've been put on there properly, you'll see why we don't worry about safety wiring those things. They, they're not coming off there if they're put on there right. And again, after test run, inspect for tight fit. Okay? Make sure you can't move that thing by hand after it's been warmed up and cooled off one time. All right, magnetic plug, okay, magnetic plug is right here on the side of the engine case, but it's in the cavity for the gearbox. Okay, if you've got an engine with the older type, you're probably going to want to talk to us about how to get that thing out of there. I highly recommend once you get it out of there that you use the new plug, all right. Um, and if you're doing this part of the maintenance, you may want to talk to us about what to torque it to. There is a torque in the book, but it's a spec for a dry cold torque. And using it on an engine that's warm and has oil on the threads, you're flirting with disaster trying to do that. Checking the oil, the uh, magnetic plug. Uh, they talk about this being an unacceptable, but don't let that hairy appearance disturb you. That's what metal or what ferrous material looks like in a magnetic environment. If you pull that off of there and mash it between your thumb and forefinger and all you've got is black paste, that's normal. Not a big deal. Don't worry about it. On the other hand, if you pull a magnetic plug out and you get something that looks like that, you might want to investigate a little more thoroughly. All right. All right. Pressure purge of the oil system. If you are building your air cam and, or you, you're reinstalling an overhauled engine on your air cam, make sure that you do service instruction 912018. That is pressure purging of the lubrication system. Why is it important to do that? Air can be trapped in the valve tappets and cause valve train failure. All right? you get, if you have air trapped in a tappet and you select a high power setting, you'll do damage to the tappet and now it won't clear and you'll have a collapsed lifter and you won't be able to hear it. There's nothing about the operation of the engine that's going to alert you that you have a collapsed lifter. But somewhere between about 70 and 120 hours later, you're going to get something that looks like that. And actually that one's kind of a tame one. All right? There are some that have been a lot worse than that. 
right? You don't want a valve failure, okay? So basically, you got, this is when you're gonna be doing that, installing an engine, or if you've got the suction portion of the oil system apart and voided for some reason, and here's all your procedures for disconnecting the oil, the return line from the tank, and putting air pressure on the tank, and then you're going to be spinning the engine until the oil pressure comes up and uh, stabilizes. Um, ensure the suction line, oil line, return lines are connected to the proper fittings of the tank. Otherwise, severe engine damage occurs. And then once you've done the pressure purge, then you're going to check the lifters. And there's instructions in the manual for pulling a valve cover, and you turn the engine so that you're at top dead center between the compression and power strokes and then you're going to push on the bottom of the rocker and observe the top of the rocker to see if you get a gap between the top of the rocker and the tip of the valve stem. If you see an immediate movement, that means I've got an air bubble in that lifter. I can compress air, I cannot compress oil. So if I push on it, typically that's done by taking the handle of a mallet and you can do that with your hip on an air cam. I treat it like a rifle. I just stand on the ladder and put the handle on the bottom of the rocker and hug the engine so that now I have the ability to put pressure on that rocker and I can see right here what the top of the rocker is doing to see if I get any movement. All right. Cooling system, All right? A lot of good reasons for having liquid cooled heads. and I could spend time going into that, but the big reason that Rotax had for doing that is that it makes the heads a lot smaller, which means the cylinders can get a lot closer to each other, which means the crankshaft can get a lot shorter, which means it can be a lot lighter, means the crank case can be a lot lighter. So that's one of the key decisions they made that got you to where you've got a 100 horsepower engine that only weighs 125 pounds. So that was one of the big reasons for it. Okay, there's some of the key items on there. You've got the coolant pump feeding water to each of the heads, and then the expansion tank collecting it and going to the radiator. There's a diagram of that. So I've got water coming from the radiator to the pump, to the heads, the expansion tank, going back to the radiator, and then I've got a pressure cap that bleeds off any air or vapor when everything expands, and then when the engine cools, it draws liquid coolant back in. So it keeps the expansion tank full at all times. 300 degrees Fahrenheit is the temperature limit for the heads on the 80 horse engine. The reason for that temperature limit is if you go over 300 degrees Fahrenheit for a significant period of time, like 30 minutes or more, or you go over 356 degrees at all, then you're going to anneal the alloy in the head. And it's going to get soft and it's going to start changing shape. And then it's going to cause problems and it will be expensive to repair because you're going to have to replace the heads. All right? On the 80 or on the 100 horse engine and on the 914, the CHT limit is 275 degrees Fahrenheit. The reason for that limit is that because of the compression ratio, if you go over that, you're going to risk getting hot spots in the combustion chamber and then you're going to start detonating your fuel. So you want to keep it under 275. Okay, there's a CHT sensor You'll see that on the number two and the number three cylinder heads right there. That's a blind hole, so that sensor is just sensing the, the temperature of the metal in the head. What were the cylinder numbers again? Two and four. Two and three. Two and three. Two and three. Okay. Now, newer engines, less than a couple years old, you can see that there's a little difference in the way the the shape of the head around the exhaust port on the older heads versus the heads on the 912 IS engine. On the IS, that shape is round. Oh, yeah, that shape is more round on there. Okay? On the new heads, there's a port up here for that temperature sensor instead. So you're actually in the coolant jacket, and it is now a coolant temperature sensor instead of a cylinder head temperature sensor. Since that engine has come out, those heads or those type of heads are now being used on the new carbureted engines as well. 
And those are the only heads that are now available. You can't buy these heads anymore should you need to replace one. All right, unless you get a used one. All right. So there's some things you have to pay attention to as far as, okay, now I've got a coolant temperature sensor instead of a cylinder head temperature sensor. And there's a service bulletin out there about the fact that if you change a cylinder head in a position where I was using the cylinder head temperature sensor, and now it is a coolant temperature sensor, I need to change the designation of the engine on the data plate, and I need to relabel my, my gauge in the cockpit, because now it's coolant instead of CHT, and I need to change my red line to 248 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, nucleate boiling, this is the reason for the limit of 248 degrees Fahrenheit. It's really hard to beat water as a coolant. The thermal density of water is gargantuan. It's 10 times that of iron. It's huge. It's an aberration of nature. I'm convinced it's that way just because God said that's the way it's going to be. There's just no other explanation for it being that big. All right? But it makes a really good coolant as a result. The limitation is what's called nucleate boiling. You've all put water in a pot and put it on the stove, and before you get a rolling boil, you see the little bubbles that are forming on the metal in there? That's what's called nucleate boiling. As long as water is in contact with the metal, the water is in control because of its thermal density. But if I get nucleate boiling and I get a little bubble forming there, and the flow of the coolant doesn't wash that bubble away, well, then that metal can get significantly hotter than the temperature of the coolant. All right? So that's what they want you to avoid. That's why the 248 degree Fahrenheit limit. Okay, the way the expansion tank works, you've got the filler neck and this lip down in here and a gasket on the pressure cap. When the engine gets hot and the coolant expands, it compresses this coil spring right here and lifts that gasket and, and it pushes coolant out. If there's any air or vapor up there, that goes out first, goes to your overflow bottle, bubbles to the top. When the engine is shut down and is cooling, then the the coolant starts contracting and this smaller spring contracts and it opens this valve right here and allows liquid coolant to come from your overflow bottle back into the expansion tank and it keeps your expansion tank full at all times. Okay, on the back end of the engine, down here in the ignition housing, there are two seals. This is a water seal and this is an oil seal because the shaft that's driving my coolant pump has to, to be driven from inside the crankcase. There's a gap between those two seals, and that gap goes over the top of what's called the weep hole right there. The purpose for the weep hole is that if I've got a liquid going past one of the seals, it has a way to escape rather than trying to push its way past the other seal. And the other reason for it is it's got a designated place for it to come out, so that when you're doing your inspections on your engine, you know exactly where to look, and you can tell if you've got a leak on that seal. And there's some maintenance procedures that go along with that, so give us a shout if you happen to see that. All right? Any questions on the liquid cooling portion? Okay? The cylinders are air-cooled. Uh, the cylinders are a little bit unique when it comes to aircraft engines. Most aircraft engines have iron cylinders. Well, if you combine aluminum pistons and iron cylinders, there's a whole bunch of limitations that occur. And as a result, when you're at colder temperatures, the piston is really too small for that cylinder. So it, it's what's called piston slap. It rattles around in there, and it does a lot of wear and tear on the piston. On these engines, the cylinder is aluminum. So the piston and the cylinder are the same material. So as they go through the temperature range, they both grow and contract at the same rate, which is really, really ideal. Now, the way they can get away with that is that they put a ceramic coating on the inside of that cylinder. That gives it the hard surface for the wear properties. You can see the cross hatching on that cylinder right there. That cylinder has 1,500 hours on it. Okay. When we overhaul the engines, we don't hone the cylinders. We don't have stones that will touch them. You've got to have diamond to cut into that ceramic. So it's, it's just that good. 
And then the neat thing about, well, a couple neat things about that. One is, is ceramic going to corrode if your engine is sitting around for a while? No. What does that do to like on your cotton? No. Freeze it. Death. Yeah. Okay. So that's one thing that's neat about that. The other thing that's neat about that is that because the piston and the cylinder are the same material, the tolerance for the difference in diameter between the piston and the cylinder are zero to eight ten thousandths of an inch. Yeah, to put that in perspective, you can't dangle a hair in that cylinder and put the piston in there. It won't go. That's how close it is. I'm impressed I can just get it that round. Okay? But that's that's the way they got the engine set up. Okay, that's part one. Race through that pretty quick. Before I jump into part two, any questions on the stuff that we... You, you said the coolant being water, but they have a recommended coolant to put into that system? Yes. Dexcool. 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 Okay. Dexcool is made by Haveline. And it has a wetter in it, doesn't it? Uh, it's... Yeah. You could call it that if you want. But basically what it is, it's an antifreeze, okay. Okay, and it's a non-silica antifreeze. Um, it's produced by Haveline, and they private label it for Prestone and Shell and a couple other companies. Uh, but you will see Dexcool on the label. That's what you want. And it'll be orange in color, so if you were to open the hood in the car that you drove in, well, okay, those of you who drove, okay. If you opened the hood and looked at the overflow bottle and saw orange, Dexcool. Okay, that's what's in there. It should be mixed 50-50 with distilled water. If you err on your mixture, err on the side of too much water, not too much Dexcool. If you get too much Dexcool, you can end up with... Um, A lot of that's already pre-mixed, isn't it? You can buy it pre-mixed. If you trust them to actually use distilled water, then go for it. Okay, any other questions on the yeah. cooling system? Um, not on the cooling system, on lubrication. Really. Okay. When should you burp your engine before you start it? I, heard, I hear it both ways. Right. If, if you pull the dipstick and it's in the normal range, don't we'll fly be happy. Okay, that's what I thought you said earlier. Right. Okay. So you don't need to just automatically burp it before you start. 